Hey there, Pastor Mace here, and today we're going to be looking at reasons for the season. I'm going to be presenting Jesus from the standpoint of if Jesus is the right decision, the moral decision. Last week I talked about how Jesus is the reasonable decision. I answered the, a couple of questions. For one, was Jesus a real person in history? How can we know that? I also answered the question of, is Jesus who he said he is, and how can we know that? And so if that's what you're wondering, and you're not so concerned about the morality behind Jesus just yet, then you're going to want to watch that video. Um, it was the previous video before that. That's Reasons for the Season, Part 1, Lagos. Today we're talking about ethos, which is an appeal to your sense of ethics. I want you to know why Jesus is the right decision, why God is good, because there's a lot of question around that, especially as... as uh, we go into hard times and we experience hard times in this broken world. A lot of people are asking, can God really be good? Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. But our theme verse with this series is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It says, set apart Jesus as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to give an answer to anyone that asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. This verse is really for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, this series, I'm hoping, gives a t equips you with a few tools and to be able to answer some people's questions, both from scripture and from, uh, and from a sense of reason. And because when people come to us with questions, we have to be able to answer their questions wherever they're at. Because some people, they're not so much concerned about, about uh, Jesus being an, an historical figure or with Jesus being morally right. They're more concerned with how Jesus makes them feel. And so you want to talk to them around that sense uh, or, you know, maybe not so much about how Jesus makes them feel, but whether or not he was a real person. You, you get the point. You want to be able to answer them where they're at. But I want to put a disclaimer in here real quick. It is not a responsibility to save people. We can't make people choose Jesus. Uh, and we can give the most eloquent arguments possible. And maybe we even are able to convince people from our sense of reasoning. But it's God that's got to change their heart. Because uh, here's the thing. When we can convince people through reasoning, we really just want to answer their questions. Uh, because, trust me, there are those on the other side who are more eloquent with words, who are more better at debate, who could demolish you and your arguments. They're silver-tongued, and they're good <laughs> at what they do. Uh, so it's got to be more than just us. It's got to be God. And uh, I just want to make sure that that is clear. But today, I want to answer the question, is God good? Well, when talking about uh, whether God is good or not, it's important for us to ask the question, what do we mean by good? Anytime someone questions the morality of God or whether God is good or not, we have to ask them, uh, what is good? What do you define good as? And so I'm going to be addressing that from a bunch of different standpoints. I'm going to start with uh, a simple one. One thing I hear people say when they, when they talk about someone as good, what they mean is that this person is honest. They're true. They're genuine. They keep their word. Um, I think about Abraham Lincoln. People say Abraham Lincoln was a good president. They call him Honest Abe. And the reason they think he was a good president and a good man was because he kept his promises. When he said he was going to do something, he did it. Uh, he, Numbers 23, 19 speaks about how God is honest. It says that God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he ever spoken, and will he not make it good? God keeps his word. And we see that demonstrated throughout scripture about how God promises something. If he says, if you do this, I will do that, he, he always keeps it whether for good or bad. Um, so certainly God is honest. He fits that definition of good. But what other definitions for good? The next one would be uh, to be considered loyal would be uh, to be good. You know, people talk about their, their goodest boys, their dogs. Mark Twain even said that the more he learns about people, the more he likes his dog. <laughs> um, many people consider their dogs to be good because their dogs are loyal. They stick by their owner. Uh, they protect them, they listen to them, they provide them with comfort, and that makes their dog a good boy. <laughs> but God also is loyal, especially to those he pledges himself to. Uh, we get a good demonstration of him being loyal to Israel, even though they are incredibly unfaithful with him. 
uh, a great passage for this is Ezekiel 16. Now, the whole chapter is great to demonstrate this, but I'm just going to read a few verses uh, throughout to, to paint the picture for you for sake of time so I can get on to other points. Um, but we're going to start in verse 1. I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. And the word of God came to me, saying, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. I'm going to skip forward to verse 8. He speaks of, he speaks of Israel. He says, when I, when I passed by you and I saw you, behold, you were at the time for love. You were ready to be married. You were ready for commitment, is what he says. So I spread my skirt over you, and I covered your nakedness. And I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord. So he's using uh, marriage imagery, uh, the imagery of being uh, a husband to Israel, to paint the picture that he pledged loyalty to them. He pledged to, to be theirs, and they pledged to be his. There was this covenant between them. Uh, he goes on to talk about how he blessed them through this covenant, and they were unfaithful. Verse 13 through 15. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your dress was of fine linen, linen, silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil. So you were exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. Then your fame went forth among the nations on account of your beauty, for it was perfect because of my splendor, which I bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. But you trusted in your beauty and played the harlot because of your fame. And you poured out your harlotries on every passerby who might be willing. They turned the blessings of God that gave them status and renown, and they used it to then to then seek after other nations and their gods. To the point where it was, they got so immoral, they were even killing their own children. Verse 20 says, Moreover, you took your sons and daughters whom you had born to me, and you sacrificed them to idols to be devoured. Were your harlotries so small a matter? You slaughtered my children, and you offered them up to idols by causing them to pass through the fire. Now that, sadly, is not poetic imagery. Israelites had started worshiping the god Molech, and literally sacrificing their children to Molech. Whereas they had committed their children to God, not for sacrifice, but to do good and to follow his ways. So indeed, this was, this was awful. But verse 35 and 37, we get God punishing them for this unfaithfulness. He says, Therefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Because your lewdness was poured out, and your nakedness uncovered through your harlotries, with your lovers and with all your detestable idols, and because of the blood of your children, which you gave to the idols, Therefore, behold, I will gather all your lovers, and whom you took pleasure, even all those whom you loved, and all those whom you hated, so I will gather them against you from every direction, and expose your nakedness to them, so that they may see all your nakedness. You see, those that you cheated on me with, the other nations that you ran to, uh, and the other gods that you served, I'm going to rise them up, and they're going to rise up against you and take you. And indeed they did. But even though... They have been so unfaithful to them, and God punished them. He is still faithful to them. At the end of this chapter, he promises them that he's not going to forsake them. Verse 60 says, Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. You will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sisters talking about the neighboring nations. Um... He says, both your older and your younger, those older nations and younger nations, and I will give them to you as daughters but not because of your covenant. Thus I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, so that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth any more because of your humiliation. When I have forgiven you for all that you have done, the Lord God declares. So he declares that he's going to grow their nation across all their neighboring nations, and he's going to forgive them for all the wrong they've done. Certainly God has not given up on them, even though they have been so unfaithful. That is a good God, a loyal God. Now, another way that people talk about good is uh, something I found out talking to a lady on the plane about Jesus. I was talking to her and she said that she believed that Jesus was a good man. And I was like, okay, we'll elaborate on that. And she went on to talk about how he was good because he helped the sick and the wounded and he fed people. She also went on to talk about how Gandhi was a good man, Charles Feeney was a good man, and there was quite a few good men on her list because her definition of good meant 
beneficial to others, helpful to others, selfless. Um, and indeed, God fits that definition of good uh, more so than anyone else. As Psalms 104 says, uh, verse 13 through 15, that uh, God waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of his works, with his uh, beneficial works, because he causes the grass to grow for the cattle and the, ve and the vegetation for the labor of men, so that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine, which makes man's heart glad, so that man may, uh, make, may have his face glisten with oil and food, which sustains a man's heart. Verse 24 says, O Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. Everything we enjoy, everything we benefit from in this life, whether we work for it ourselves or someone else worked for it and gave it to us, all of it is only possible because of God. He created the oxygen we, we breathe. The earth exists because it is the perfect distance from the sun and the moon, even. Verse 19 speaks of how the sun knows its place because of God. Uh, the earth is moving at the perfect speed to maintain its orbit, and it's at the perfect angle to keep these things all in check. But let's bring, make it more personal. Your very own brain and body, which is designed by God. See, here's the thing about our, our brains and our bodies that have been designed by God and created by Him. You may not benefit in those departments as much as others. Others may have a, a brain that works better or a body that works better, but that doesn't mean that you're not benefiting from God in those areas. Someone doesn't cease to be beneficial because they're more beneficial to others than you. They don't cease to be beneficial because they're more beneficial to you than to others. Someone ceases to be beneficial when they're not benefiting anyone, and yet God benefits everyone. He's the most beneficial of anyone. So certainly God is, is good in that respect. Now, some of you are probably exasperated because you want me to get to the definition of good that means to be morally right, to be just. And that is a difficult thing to try to explain and reconcile with because it'd be impossible to reconcile God as morally just with everybody's sense of morality because everybody has their own sense of morality. This is a result of, of Genesis chapter 3, when man decided that they weren't going to follow God's sense of right and wrong. They were going to determine that for themselves. In fact, that's the very first sin that plays into all other sins. <laughs> um, if you just recall, God, God pretty much tells them, all right, look, all, the, all these trees are good to eat from except this one. This one tree is not good to eat from. But then it says that the woman looked at the tree and she saw that it was good for food. So she is determining what God said is not good to eat. She is determining that it is good to eat. Her sense of morality, her sense of right and wrong has now differed from God's. She has now decided what is right and wrong for herself and she is playing God. She's trying to be her own God. Isn't that what the serpent tempts her with? God knows in the moment you eat of it, you will become gods yourselves, knowing right and wrong for yourselves. And ever since then, mankind has been determining its own sense of right and wrong. And here's the issue with that. When every man determines what's right and wrong for themselves, no man is able to say what is right and wrong for another man because they're not greater than any other man. So they can't, they can't determine that for others. So that causes some big issues when it comes to God. We can't judge God by our own sense of morality because we can't even get our own act together. Meanwhile, God knows what is right and wrong, and God is greater than us. If anybody has a right to determine what is right and wrong, that would be God, and that would put him in the moral right. He speaks to this in Isaiah 29, verse 15 and 16. Just listen to this. He said, Woe to those who hide their plans from the Lord and whose deeds are done in a dark place. And they say, who sees us? Or who knows us? You distort things. You turn things around. Shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay? That what is made should say to its maker, he didn't make me. Or what is formed would say to him who formed it, the one who formed me has no understanding, doesn't know what they're talking about. 
Isn't this what's happening? When, when we try to judge God as evil or good, we are judging God by our own sense of morality, as though we are greater than God, as though we are equal with God on some point and are able to determine what's right and wrong for him. That's a bit distorted, right? The clay is not equal with the potter. It is the potter that gets to determine what is right and wrong. And God does promise there will come a time when all will know what is right and wrong according to his standard. In that same chapter, in verse 24, he says, Those who err in mind will know the truth, and those who criticize will accept instruction. God also warns those that play God by making such declarations of what is right and wrong. He says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. See, when people say that God is not just, they're claiming that their sense of morality is better than his. Which leads us to our next definition. The one who gets to decide what's right and wrong of another is the designer. The next definition for what makes something good is whether it does what it was designed to do or not. Just take a light bulb, for instance. We'll say a light bulb is good or bad based on whether or not it does what it was designed to do, whether it gives light. You know, you'll say, oh, that light bulb's no longer working. It's no longer giving light. It's a bad bulb. Or, hey, don't throw that bulb away. It still gives light. It's a good bulb because it does what it's designed to do or it doesn't. And God is not a created being. He is not something that is designed. So God cannot be considered evil or good on this count unless he gives himself expectations, unless he places expectations upon himself, which he does. He makes promises in scripture, but he keeps those. That kind of goes back to the honesty uh, definition of good. So I don't want to get back there. Instead, I got to bring this around to us now. We are not good because we do not do as we are designed to do. The Bible makes clear that God made us in his image. We are meant to reflect God, to reflect his goodness, to reflect his sense of right and wrong, and yet we don't. We choose to determine it for ourselves, saying things that God says is good is bad and saying things that God says is bad is good. And that puts us in the wrong. We are not good. And a moral judge must judge those who are not good. But before I talk about that, I must answer this. Uh, probably the biggest objection I hear to the doctrine that God is good, the biggest uh, reason people have struggled with whether God is good or not, is because there is evil in the world. They say, because God, because there is evil in the world, God cannot be good. Or there cannot be a God. They'll even go so far as to say that. Two questions that really shut down this argument. The first one is, is God committing the evil himself? Now, I'll answer the second question that people will raise and, and as a rebuttal to that question. But the first question, is God committing evil himself? No, God is not. He's not the one that is, that is sinning. He lives up to his moral standard. Meanwhile, there are people... Uh, just because there's people sinning and other people doing evil does not mean that God himself is evil. But doesn't God have an obligation to do something about it? Well, that leads us to the second question. Is God doing nothing about the evil in the world? Is he complacent? Amos 3.7 tells us that surely the Lord God will do nothing unless he reveals it to his servant, the prophets. So we can look in God's word to see his reaction to the evil in the world. In fact, a big issue people have with God's word is that it's too judgmental. He speaks too much about evil in the world. He declares too much judgment against evil in the world, according to some people's standard, because <laughs> they have a different morality than God's. And uh, God makes it very clear that he is not okay with evil. He is not complacent in it. In fact, he even promises that all who sin, all who do evil, must die. And we know that holds true. Every last one of us have done evil to some extent. Even if we're better than others, we still have done evil. We still have sinned. We still have failed God's morality. What God says is right and wrong, and we all die. But he goes beyond that. He says that he will judge after death every person according to every last one of their deeds. He will bring all their deeds before them, good and bad. That seems that like God is very thorough in handling evil in the world. And that is a very good incentive 
for evil people to start doing good, knowing that all their actions are going to be judged. So God deters evil and enforces, well, encourages good behavior. Not only that, but he goes a step further. And this leads us to another definition for good and the final definition I'm going to talk about today. People will say someone is good if they love others, even when they don't deserve it. And so you think about how a good God looks at the world, a world that has completely rejected him, a world filled with evil, where even the most innocent and the most good among us are not sinless. And so according to his declaration before the first man ever sinned, that if man chose to reject God, if they chose to decide right and wrong for themselves, to be evil, that they would die, he must put them to death. Ezekiel 18.20 says the soul that sins must die. But we also know that God does love. He does have love. He does fit this definition of good as well. 2 Peter 3.9 says God does not desire that any should perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. So how does God satisfy his perfect sense of justice and his loving desire that all people he created would be in right standing with him? Well, that's where the Christmas story comes into play. The Christmas story is the ultimate show of God's goodness. It shows how God fits all these definitions that we have for good. He sent his son to be born as a man. And Jesus fulfills the moral obligation of man. He is perfectly the image of God. He reflects God's goodness in all that he thought and all that he does and all that he says. Hebrews 1.3 says this. It says he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. That's Jesus. God in the flesh who lives perfectly as we ought to, with one purpose in mind, so that he could satisfy God's sense of justice, so that he could pay the price for our sins, so that he could die for us. That's what the next part of that verse in Hebrews 1.3 says. When he had made purification for sins, when he had made the payment for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. By doing this, Jesus satisfied both God's desire for justice and his desire to have those whom he created in right standing with him. And this made God very happy. We're told this in Isaiah 53 verse 10. It says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, as a payment for sin, then he promises that that the man who does this, speaking of Jesus, will see the fruit of his labor. He will see his offspring, those who have been saved because of his death. And because of that, he will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So God will be delighted for Jesus to be our guilt offering to pay for our sins. And because of that, Jesus will see those whom have been saved because of his sacrifice. And it says that he will prolong his days, meaning that Jesus will be resurrected, which we know he has. Again, Refer to last, the last message, part one, if you need to understand that better. But it says, uh, says also that this is in connection with his offspring. So we also have eternal life through Jesus. We have prolonged days because Jesus has prolonged days as his offspring. And that the Father, because of this, will be increasingly pleased because of what Christ has done. And that's the Christmas story of God going out of his way to become a man. And how and, and can you just see how that demonstrates God's loyalty? How you can de- see that demonstrates God's benevolence? How he goes out of his way to benefit others? His deep sense of justice that he can't just forgive us, but he has to pay the price for it too? Can you see how it demonstrates his desire to right all wrongs in the world? And how it demonstrates his faithfulness to keep his promises? By accepting Jesus, you were fulfilling a moral obligation that you have before God to have your sins paid for. And you're fulfilling a moral obligation before God to acknowledge him as your, as your creator and your God. Jesus is the right decision.
Now, in the next video, I'll be talking about how trusting in Jesus is the most satisfying and joyful decision you could ever make. But I hope I was able to properly demonstrate how God is good and Jesus is the right and moral decision that we all must make to you today. I'm curious if you have other questions. If so, if you'd leave them in the comments and I'd love to address those. But for now, you have a wonderful day and praise our good God.